Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to our inaugural Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations Town Hall. Our topic for today is racism, white supremacy, and societal mental health. I am Dr. Bandy Lee, president of the World Mental Health Coalition, which is sponsoring today's event. Co-chairing with me is Dr. Kevin Washington. He's a board member of the World Mental Health Coalition, past president of the Association of Black Psychologists, and head of the Sociology and Psychology Department at Grambling State University. Our moderators today are Leonard and Mark. The World Mental Health Coalition is a professional organization that formed to foster societal mental health. The United States is presently confronting a dangerous collective racist mindset that has protected and encouraged violence against non-whites for over 400 years. The pervasiveness of white supremacist ideology shields its adherents from ostracism and prosecution while subjecting non-whites, especially Blacks, Latinx, Native Americans, and Asians to various forms of discrimination and violence. Racism is a non-scientific, non-factual belief that is rooted in narcissistic pathology, arising from an emotional need to assert superiority over others in order to fight a deep-seated sense of inferiority or lack of self-respect. Collective societal disorders can have results much like what happens to individuals. Truths and priorities are distorted with maladaptive behavior leading to destruction at both the individual and social levels. The acceptance and incorporation of white supremacist attitudes and fears in our cultural, social, legal, economic, and political systems made it possible a few years ago for a dangerous, mentally impaired white supremacist to become president of the United States. His toleration by many to the point of utter impunity fueled escalating pandemic deaths, economic devastation, civil strife, and dangerous stoking of terrorism, culminating in a violent insurrection designed to keep him in power at any cost. Indeed, four years of his words, attitudes, actions, and personal mental pathology reflected, as well as considerably exacerbated, the problems and dangers con confronting our society. That is why we must find new and formal ways to incorporate psychological insights into social and political discourse before there is further collective impairment and self-annihilation. Racist beliefs cause profound suffering to the victims, but also force the perpetrators to assume a posture that requires constant vigilance, having to defend one's illegitimate rank and right to dominate, chronically scanning for threats and limiting one's ability to connect with other human beings. Our societal mental health requires that we examine these beliefs consciously and collectively in order to expose and transform the underlying pathological premise that has resulted in violence against the mind, body, and spirit of both victims and perpetrators. We must do this in solidarity for in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The World Mental Health Coalition brings mental health professionals together with allies in other disciplines to help protect societal mental health. In line with our activities in recent years, which you can view at our website, worldmhc.org or dangerouscase.org, we believe it is our duty to inform the public of the threat that white supremacist ideology poses to the well being and cohesion of our society and political system. In pursuit of this goal, we have gathered today to begin our project for national healing. We will be bringing together leading intellectuals, mental health professionals, and other speakers of truth. Our keynote today, Professor Cornell West a foremost academic of the country, a public intellectual and activist, now quitting Harvard University because of racism to join Union Theological Seminary as a Dietrich Bonhoeffer chair this summer. Professor West is the author of 20 books and editor of 13. 
He has previously held tenure at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and is Professor Emeritus at Princeton University. So Professor West, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, my dear sister. I salute you, I salute your vision, your courage, and your willingness to not only take a risk, but bear burden in terms of your truth telling and your justice seeking. And when I heard that the inimitable and the one and only, my dear brother, Dr. Professor, revolutionary force in the world, Wade Noble was in the house. I'm just profoundly humbled. I hope people recognize who he is and the gravitas of his witness going all the way back Bay Area, Stanford University, Zambarto, Russell, R R Russell Banks, and uh, Sinclair Drake. I mean, he, he, he's the godfather of many of us. And so today I'm just really speaking, maybe like Johnny Hodges and Duke Ellington Band, he's Theolonia's monk. You know, he, he's the towering figure. And, uh, and I say that not in, in, in an uncritical deferential way because we learn from each other, but I've learned so much from him and I just want to acknowledge that. And I'm so glad that you brought the others as well. So our dear sister, Mumo and uh, Gabriello, and of course, my dear brother, Greg, Greg Carr, he, he, he's freedom fighter par excellence. Uh, going all the way back to our dialogue with the great John Henry Clark, he's another towering giant. Because anytime we talk about racism or white supremacy and so forth, it's important not to begin with the white normative gaze. I think we have to begin with those who have been dealing with the bombardment. And we can do it empathetically in terms of folk who are, who are in other great traditions who connect and are in solidarity, or like myself, I do it from my own people, my own community, my own West family, my own shallow Baptist church, my own hood, my own, my, my own ghetto from which I emerge. And the crucial thing is this, it's hard to find a people who have been hated for 400 years so chronically, who keep dishing out love and produce love warriors. And this is not an abstract formulation. How to be Wells, was a love warrior on the ground. Martin Luther King Jr., love warrior on the ground. Malcolm X, love warrior on the ground. And so when you think of racism, the last thing we want to do is to get caught up in the weight, the gravity, the impossibility of overcoming and looking at the world through the vantage point of the very gaze that is reproducing the domination, the degradation, and the marginalization. So that we come from a great people, black people, African people, in the face of overwhelming terror, keep producing freedom fighters, not calling for terrorizing others, not black versions of the Ku Klux Klan, but saying in the face of being terrorized, we want liberty for everybody. That's Harriet Tubman, that's Sojourner Truth. You see, that's Frederick Douglass that in the face of being traumatized for 400 years, chronically, that organized greed, institutionalized hatred and contempt and routinized trauma. In the face of trauma, here come the wounded healers, not the wounded herders. We don't accent those, we accent the ugly effects because we know every community has gangsters, every community has thugs. Every community has haters, but the best of the community, that's where the greatness lies, you see. And that's where the figures like the way nobles come in. And of course you can't separate him from Annie Mae Cotton and John, his father, the network that produced him all the way back to the great civilizations of Africa itself. This is not romanticizing. This is not idealizing. We're accenting the best. Every civilization, every empire, every people have the best and the worst. But the question is, how do we recognize the best and always draw the intimate connection between the spiritual and the social, the existential and the economic, the personal and the political, so we don't end up reproducing the narrow 
academic division of knowledge that doesn't allow us to get a sense of the whole. Because we're concerned with the whole person, the whole community, and to tell the whole truth. And the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. So we got to talk about empire and indigenous peoples. Got to talk about patriarchal forms of domination and precious women across the board. You got to talk about white supremacy in all of its various forms, with the be African, indigenous peoples, Asians, and so forth. You got to talk about predatory capitalism, losing sight of the humanity of poor people and working people. Got to talk about homophobia and our precious gays and lesbian brothers and sisters and non-binary. That's the all-embracing caravan of love that the Isley brothers sang about. That's my tradition. And that caravan of love means justice is what love looks like in public, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. And I come from a tender people. And that's exactly what I want to, to, to pass on to the next voice, as it were. Brother Kevin Washington, we thank you for your vision. We thank you for your work. We thank you for your, your witness. But here we believe in lifting every voice. That's the anthem of a great people, lift every voice, not echo though. We're not talking about extensions of echo chambers. We're talking about finding your voice, just like your fingerprint, unique and singular. And in lifting that voice, bouncing off those, that voice from the past of the dead and the present of the quick, so that that voice becomes a force for good in the language of John Coltrane, a force for real good. And if it's a force for real good, it means you're gonna have to serve and sacrifice. You're going to have to pay a cost. Let me stop there and pass it back to my dear sister, sister Lee. Thank you, Brother Cornell, for those Thank inspiring you. words. Uh, now I will turn it over to Dr. Washington to introduce the next speakers. It was my responsibility to introduce uh, Dr. Wade Nobles and uh, Dr. Uh, Greg Carr, but it seems like our dear brother Wes gave the the introduction. So now I'm, it's a, a way of trying to figure out how to uh, append, right? How to add or how to amend uh, the greatness that was just uh, uh, enunciated. We must recognize that we are in the presence of greatness. Dr. West, thank you so much for, for the eloquence of which you are able to utter uh, the condition of our time, the tenor of our moment, to utilize the, the instrumentation of our people, the cold train, the monk, understand that all of those create a cacophony of who we are as a people. And so when we talk about the elevation of consciousness, when we talk about rising, raising those who are actually intellectually dead to a, a next level, we cannot do that in the black community without talking about Dr. Wade Nobles, if I be me. Uh, we cannot do that. He's one person who has been on the battlefield creating a conceptualization of, of, for people to see themselves as being whole. He talks about extending the splendor uh, and then healing the rupture of the African psyche. He is one of the founders of uh, the Association of Black Psychologists. He is one who has elevated an organization so that people can come behind him uh, to be able to continue the work that he's done among the, the farm, among the, uh, the Bantu, uh, the Lebo, among the Akan, uh, in, in the Indabele, the Swana, the Tosa uh, in, South, in South Africa. He is that person who is creating the pathway. Not only is he a uh, preeminent psychologist, he is the father of uh, what we know as uh, African psychology. So it has a, a clarity of the voice that he says he brings back the, the, uh, the notion of what it means to be human into our African reality. And then he speaks to us today to talk then about how to elevate ourselves to be uh, and to become more powerful. I'm going to uh, yield this moment right now to allow uh, uh, my Baba, the person who, to his father, not only he's, he's written books, he's a father of many children. I know his children, but he has other children. And so he, uh, I'm one of those, those children that he has uh, continued to, to foster into consciousness. Uh, and so I thought it not robbery to uh, have him to come and to share and to have a, a, a sincere discussion about what does the repair look like for a population. Dr. Wade Nobles, if I be me, uh, Baba, I yield now to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Kevin. And I want to tell my brother, Cornell West, that next time I see you in person, we're going to have a talk about how you set me up to be in a place <laughs> that I'm not sure I deserve to be in. Uh, I, uh, I hope the audience know that, uh, that Greg and Kevin and Cornell and I are more than just colleagues. 
We are spirit brothers. And until you understand the African way, you don't know what that spirit means. Uh, we are what, and, and Craig, I mean, Corner, you did this. We are what Thelonious Monk meant to John Coltrane, what John Coltrane meant to Charles Yardbird Parker. Yeah. Each one of them had a special resonating tone that combined to give us the symphony of what it means to be human through their medium. And what I want to do is to share with this audience that every time one of you says something good about me, I translate it to ancestors mm. because it's not me. It is not me. I'm a conduit that is the voice of messages that come through me. And if I quiet myself long enough, as my Angelo has always said, if I quiet myself long enough, I'll hear the voice of God. I want you to hear that. Quiet yourself long enough and you hear the voice of God. And God only speaks truth, no matter how discomfort it makes others be. Let me share a truth that's come to me. We're talking about reconciliation and reparations. And the first thing I want to put on the table is the attempted epistemicide of African thought. Epistemicide, the attempt to mm -hmm. kill our ability to even know what it means to be African. And so we walk in the world, fumbling, stumbling, trying to be, but be like something that we are not. We take the westernization of our very soul and try to model it as some people that we are seeking respect from, recognition from. And then we end up looking at them and realizing who they really are. It is a difficult perception. This idea of whiteness, there is a really a new invention in the world of human affairs. The concept of whiteness only started appearing around the 1600s. Now, humans have been around for 1.4 million years. We're talking about 1600s, whiteness appears and it begins to mutate itself. Whiteness appears and mutates itself as white supremacy. Now, we, we, are, we are correct in talking about this past occupier of the White House as a white supremacist, but he is not a mentally deranged white supremacist. White supremacy itself is a mental illness. White supremacy itself is a mental illness, and he captured the best of whiteness, which is to reflect itself as white supremacy, which is comparable to human savagery. Look at this assault on the Capitol. The very place where this whole country holds to be sacred, the very place where this whole country holds up to the world as something you should bow down to and respect savages assaulted it. I'm gonna say that again, savages assaulted us because white supremacy in its raw form is human savagery. Now we hold that up and have to interrogate that because what it ends up showing us and telling us is that white supremacy is savagery and it has its different forms. It is like, it is like shape shifting shape shifting, it shifts its shape to be a mild form called the Karens of the world who, who, who call place on young kids selling lemonade. It shape shifts itself to become the alt-right who walks throughout the Capitol holding a Confederate flag of treasoners, of the treasoners as if that were a normality. So for the first truth we must have to deal with is to call white supremacy what it is in its mutated form. It is white supremacy. We should, we should eliminate the discussion about racism as if everybody can be racist and recognize that everybody can't be a white supremacist. Everybody can be infected by white supremacy. But white supremacy is the mental illness. And in fact, I've been thinking, or at least it's been coming through me now, that, that white supremacy is like a airborne disease. It is an airborne disease and that we have to mask up to protect ourselves from breathing in white supremacy. We have to social distance ourselves from being victimized by the white supremacists. And we have to recognize that as any disease, 
there's a form that is asymptomatic, asymptomatic that all of us walk around saying, I'm not a white supremacist, that, uh, that uh, I uh, am not a racist, but then they stand in silence when, and allow themselves to accept unaffected the horror that white supremacists perpetrate on black people and other peoples of color. You cannot be quiet about white supremacy. And if you do, you should interrogate yourself and realize that you are asymptomatic, that the raw, the raw rugged, ruthless symptoms of white supremacy, you don't show because you're asymptomatic. But the fact of the matter is that your quietness, your refusal to stand up against white supremacy, your refusal to call out white supremacy, your refusal to ponder, how is it that this former president of the United States garnered almost half of the voting public in this United States? That's a horrible statistic. And how is it that those individuals walking around every single day of the world can align themselves and excuse his conduct and accept his conduct other than the fact that they are asymptomatic white supremacists. And then they hide in our schools as principals. They hide in our schools as teachers. They hide in our schools as police officers. They hide in our schools as folk that we do not expect to be our tormentor. But as as is come to me to understand is that there is hope. There is hope because everything that African people have created has always been grounded in a hope for a better day. Old folks would see it, that in the morning time, there'll be a better time. That there's hope and grace in our very genetic fiber. And so we got to shift, if I may, shift from not only just understanding the devastating of this pathological condition called white supremacy, we have to also shift ourselves and begin to talk about how do we rescue, rescue African deep thought not filtered through the prism of white academic intellectualism, but raw, clear, crystal clear African deep thought that says, here's what it means to be human. Here's what it means to be a loving human being. Here's what it means in every symbolic gesture I make in interacting with other human beings. That is the task that I want us to move to. Understand that if, if I'm engaging in Engaging in a society that is infected by white supremacy, that I have to try to figure out some ways to engage in inoculation. We're around now trying to get this vaccine to help people. Well, maybe we should spend some genius figure out not a, not a COVID vaccine, but a white supremacy vaccine. And then we can shoot up everybody. Because things line up, line up everybody. Get your shot. Get your shot because you're in an infected environment. Get your shot so you can understand and think clearly about what it means to be human. See, every single ethnic community, and, I, and I've used that ethnic term de, uh, decidedly because it is also a mutated concept, but every ethnic community has the right and authority to declare to the world, this is what it means to be human for me. This is what it means to be human. And I will walk in the world as I do, as a spirit being with an African face. You can't take away my African face without denying my humanity. You can't take away my spiritness without dehumanizing me. And that's what this whole engagement has been about. To dehumanize Africans during our enslavement was not just to dehumanize us, but to de-Africanize us. So we run around saying we're not African. We run around saying African is bad. We run around declaring ourselves not African. See, the de-Africanization was a vulgar attempt to despirit us, not despiritualize us, because despiritualize us has the connotation of religiosity, but the despirit has the connotation of physics, of spirit, of energy. I'm a living energy force, power, and that it, my oppression keeps me from, from reflecting ourselves like a, like, a, like a flower blossoms in the sun. My spiritness blossoms in the sun of understanding what it means to be African. And so I will We'll, we'll stop with that point, is that the conversation for me has to go to allowing African people to engage in what it means to be divinely human. Having Hispanic people to engage in that, Asian people to engage in that. Every community has to engage in that on their own terms. I don't want you to say, you, you have my permission to do it. You're divine. You don't need my permission. You just have to declare yourself as who you are. 
and then engage in a worldwide global conversation of what humanity really looks like. And African, Africa can provide some leadership in doing that. And I want to thank uh, Bandy and uh, Kevin for giving me an opportunity to sit and be uh, made uncomfortable by Cornell West and, and Greg Carr. <laughs> to be made uncomfortable by Kevin Washington, but I find my stability by saying it ain't me. I'm just a conduit through following the African voice to speak through me. Thank you very much. And many times we find ourselves trying to regulate certain things in our lives, but we don't plug back into the source. And so you remind us that in our Africanity, that when we become disconnected from our source, we then have ourselves in a problematic space. You remind us also of the dynamic of white uh, terrorism, white supremacy, which is the disease and uh, not racism. And so thank you for the elevation again of consciousness. And so you, you do what you always do. You bring us to the next level, the next level of understanding who we are as a people. From the first article that I read uh, from Vo Voodoo IQ, the introduction to African psychology to the present. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know means one of the, the latest books that Dr. Carl was talking about earlier. That's what you do. You elevate us and, and let us know we have to be realigned with who we really are and not try to be who we are not. My uh, Dr. Carr is, the, uh, we know him as the associ uh, associate professor African Africana studies and Afro American, the chair of Afro American um, studies at Howard University. We also he's a professor of law. The brother is so uh, nice. He yet he went back twice and has uh, two uh, dynamic degrees of a historian and also a legal mind. Uh, that is that is profound in and of itself. But uh, he is a he's, he is a movie. He's been the faculty uh, of the year at the institution. He is. He's one who's known uh, in, in ASCAC circles, uh, that is the uh, association that looks at who we are as a people. He is known uh, globally uh, as, a, as a profound scholar, but if you ever go into Howard's campus you, and walk with him, you cannot walk two steps without someone pulling and saying, Dr. Carr, thank you. Dr. Carr, let me ask you a question because he is that person, that person who uh, uh, also brings people to a level of awareness of, of who they are in the moment by unpacking and uncovering the historical past. Uh, and also he can then slice you up with the law and tell you why you need to move forward in the future uh, legally. So I want to uh, uh, introduce to, to some and uh, reintroduce to others uh, a good friend of mine uh, from back in the day uh, to the present as we were churning uh, butter uh, academically, trying to figure out what's what and still trying to figure it out. Uh, Dr. Uh, Greg Carr, thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Thank you, uh, Brother Kevin. And uh, thank everyone. Uh, thank everyone uh, here who has uh, convened. And I want to just echo what uh, our Babas have said. Um, Baba Wade uh, Nobles, who is been a shaping figure in my life like so many others and yes sir the ancestors speak through you but the conduit has to be sturdy enough for them to be able to do it so bob i want to thank you That's and right. uh right. a word that you brought back into our consciousness from east africa a term um the the term jegna out of the amharic people uh, a term that we have learned from you to use uh to displace as our, our, our friend and brother and Baba um, Cornell West has reminded us in displacing that white gaze, the concept of Jegna rather than mentor uh, with all of its cultural context, the, the concept of Jegna out of the Ethiopian people to talk about someone who is fearless, who shows ex exceptional insight, who stands true. And so as, as a Jegna, uh, Baba Wade and, and, and Baba Cornell, of course, is a Jegna and, we probably, in fact, I'm sure we all are most uh, aware, as we heard uh, our sister, Dr. Lee, Fandy Lee, say, um, your latest demonstration of jegnaship uh, opens the way. I think it was Henry Garnett. Was it Henry Helen Garnett that said, uh, speak and leave the rest to God? Well, when you, uh, <laughs> when you speak, Baba, you've left the rest. And uh, the academy is shaking, and as well it should considering what Scott Galloway at NYU calls the academy often, says these elite schools, many of them are hedge funds uh, who, let, who educate the children of the investors and let a few uh, students with high test scores and grades from the lower and working classes in to cover their shame and guilt. Uh, everything is about to be remade in this society. So 
it's particularly uh, important for uh, us to gather and uh, for everyone here with the coalition um, to be in this space. And, you know, Dr. Lee, you said something in your most recent book, and you say, you know, we need to understand the political and economic context um, and, and what it means for a society to be unwell mentally, to understand that it has a great deal to do with the political and economic structure. And of course, I mean, I couldn't agree more and so it seems to me that an important thing for us to start with and to continue this dialogue with, because I'm really looking forward uh, in the dialogue and in the conversation, particularly after we hear from uh, Christalis and Alicia, to think about what it means to be in this country, which I often think about, you know, is really not a nation. And again, I mean, here we are in this convening and, uh, the, you know, the background, the memory of our of folks who are leading in leading out in the discussion as we open up, we, we have represented folk from the home team, whether it be the Caribbean or whether it be the North American continent. What has settler violence done in a space where uh, from the first people who came here with an intent to dispossess others of their humanity, they created a field that we are still responding to. What does it mean to be a citizen? Why are we still talking about citizenship? Why is that the gold standard of humanity? So to even talk about a more perfect union is to reinscribe the idea of this union in the first place, which leads me to the real question. And we're talking about truth, reconciliation and reparations, which is uh, we got to ask our question. And, and it's, it's a question that our sister ancestor, Tony K. Bambara asked at the beginning of her novel, The Salt Eaters. You know, you know honey, are you sure? Do you want to be well? And Baba Wade, you did it again, brother. Because if this thing is, is a virus, then in fact, the cure may mean the disaggregation of the criminal enterprise, the set the colony turn, set the state we're talking about. Because what's left if we become well? <laughs> what really is left if we become well? Because we can't reverse engineer what has happened. And again, I, and I'll echo uh, you, uh, uh, Baba Kevin. And again, Baba Wade, if you haven't read his book, The Island of Memes, uh, written in the wake of uh, one of a series of vis visits to Haiti in the wake of the 2010 earthquake, a meditation on what it means in, in that eastern third of the island once known as Hispaniola, the island renamed by those Africans who uh, willed themselves into liberation, Haiti, in a gesture to the Taino people, the high place. Uh, what does it mean in a space like Haiti where you see Africa convened, because it hadn't been convened before that. Uh, convened in a place where the common enemy, the common foe, the common literal oppressor and a, the common concept of oppression is struggled against and it creates a form of unity. But at the same time, they're trying to create something that had never existed before. These Fon people, these uh, Kikongo people, these Yoruba people, blending and remixing and blending and remixing and then uh, at the key moment in 1791, when you have uh, Bukman Dutty says, cast down the image of the white man's God who has brought down your tears for so long and listen to liberty, which lives in all our hearts. What does it mean? What is left if we become well? What does it mean? And, and so I guess in, in the couple of seconds I have at the beginning of this conversation, thinking about truth. You know, if our identities are anchored in whiteness and responses to it. If we can talk about in a minute and again, I'm really looking forward, you know, as, as I anticipate hearing you, Alicia, you know, to call yourself Lakota, to call yourself Oglala, and to think about the fact that Sue is not the name that would have been given. And then that response to settler colonialism, moments of triumph, where African people in this country talk about the Emancipation Proclamation and have never heard of Little Crow. And do what Abraham Lincoln did to Little Crow and them out there in what is now Minnesota. To think about the idea that if we do come to some notion of truth and reconciliation, we must recognize that we do not have common identities. We do not have common memories. And that two things don't mean the same thing. The genius of our brother, um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, emptied into brown face and black face minstrelsy and uh, I would I, I like to think I would be have been trying to kill Alexander Hamilton 
or George Washington <laughs> or uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and not kill because I'm seeking to murder somebody, but kill in the righteous indignation that David Walker wrote and talk about. Are you a Christian? Yes. OK. Is slavery wrong? Yes. Well, are you going to let me go? No. Well, then yeah, you are not a Christian, but in fact, the devil. <laughs> I'm authorized. So that can't get remixed into I'm not throwing away my shot unless we don't want to be well. If we're going to talk about the truth. And so part of the truth may involve a violence of forgetting if we're going to go to reconciliation, because reconciliation presumes that it's possible to somehow reconcile with evil. And unless unless we're going to dissolve these identities, unless we're not only going to dissolve whiteness, but dissolve the responses to whiteness. And as I listen to uh, to my Baba's engage in this process of thinking through how we contribute to a human possible, possible how we contribute to a, a future that looks different to where we've been. I think about the fact that some things may just have to be forgotten, realizing that education is a process of selective remembering anyway. As an African person who was born and raised in Tennessee, who uh, went to law school thinking you could use the law as a weapon to destroy and dismantle these systems only to realize that the law itself is violence, to gesture towards Jacques Derrida and others in many ways, it occurred to me that perhaps our best path forward is to simply understand that we must, in terms of our common humanity, as Booker Washington said, move forward together. And in terms of the things that we hold out as distinct, we must create the space to be able to contribute our distinct perspectives to each other in dialogue, but not try to collapse those uh, distinct identities, those distinct uh, ways of knowing and being in the world into some monocultural uh, concept, even like a nation, because the United States isn't a nation. It's a set the state and we're all struggling as human beings to try to reconcile that with the possibility of being human in the world and staying on the planet. Because the planet looks like it's getting ready to reset and put us off it in there anyway. So we don't have a lot of time. I'm gonna stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bob Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sister Manny. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Brother Greg, for elevating us uh, yet again, uh, understanding the disease to reconcile uh, with evil, right? Does that, is that possible? What, is it, what does wellness look like in, uh, after having uh, been normalized in sickness? Powerful piece. What does sanity look like when insanity has become the normalcy? Uh, how, do, how does one become realigned? Because when you start making something get correct, uh, there's a lot of pain in that. When the blood has uh, stopped flowing to a certain limb, and then it starts flowing again. There's a there's pain in that, and so so there's a process here that I think there we have to go through a certain amount of pain, but it has to be led and guided by people who understand humanity, uh, and that is and what does what does it really mean to be human, and we have to question ourselves, to really ask ourselves, have we really experienced the best that humanity has had to offer in this space, and I would suggest that as you advanced. Uh, the answer to that is no, and that, the, that there has to be something else because we're running out of time. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Washington, and thank you, Baba Wade Nobles and Brother Gregory Carr for your powerful words. I often bring the paradigm of health where uh, sickness seeks homogeneity and simplicity uh, where or or symbolism, uh, whereas health is characterized by diversity uh, in unity. Uh, so on that note, we'll uh, switch from the powerful African voices to uh, voices from the Latinx community and Native American community. Professor Cristalis Capiello Rosario has been an important voice in the Latinx community. Herself from Puerto Rico, she received her doctorate in counseling psychology from the University of Georgia and is currently a tenure track assistant professor in counseling and counseling psychology in the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts at Arizona State University. She held various national leadership positions and is a former officer of the National Latinx Psychological Association. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Capiello Rosario. Good afternoon, everyone. I my soul is being fed, so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to <laughs> to communicate uh, what I wanted to communicate this afternoon. Uh, but I just wanted to start uh, by acknowledging that uh, most of my family still lives in U.S. occupied Puerto Rico, 
Uh, and the other half of my family is here because of U.S. occupation in Puerto Rico. Um, and so what I would like to share with you, as Dr. Wes uh, uh, shared earlier, from the experience, from the Puerto Rican experience, what is truth means for us, what is healing and reconciliation may mean for us. Um, so I, I do have uh, some, a couple of, uh, of slides to, to share with you. Um, and uh, I, I want to continue or, or start the conversation uh, by acknowledging the ethical guidelines of uh, the National Latinx Psychological Association, which says that to be a psychologist is to be human, and to be human is to be political, so you cannot be a psychologist without being um, uh, political. So my responsibility, as I see it as a Puerto Rican psychologist, is so that my personal and professional selves help uh, to uh, decolonize uh, Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans. Um, so while colonization may refer to the political, social, and economic control of a territory, in this case, uh, the U.S. over Puerto Rico, coloniality, as Nelson Maldonado talks about, uh, Puerto Rican himself, is the ideologies, the narratives uh, that make it so, right, that sustain um, U.S. colonial oppression um, in the island. And so it first starts by right, ra racializing the other, saying that our culture is Puerto Rican society, our Puerto Rican society, our experiences, our histories, uh, our knowledge um, are inferior. They're either underdeveloped or they don't exist at all. Um, and so when that becomes our intersubjective reality, then a climate and an ethic um, of political exclusion um, economic exploitation, cultural control, uh, and social fragmentation takes, takes hold. Uh, this is what a uh, uh, Latinx scholar Aníbal Quijano calls communality of power. Um, then Maldonado Torres says, well, these are initially externally produced, right, as, as uh, you may see in the case of, of, of Puerto Rico and Latin America, uh, but these colonial technologies eventually become internalized by the oppressed group. Uh, this communality of, of being. In other words, we, we end up, right, thinking, living our experiences, our collective identity, and even how we relate to one another through a white gaze. Put it another way, we end up colluding inadvertently in our own, in our own oppression. Um, and these are, these are the colonial technologies that have oppressed my people uh, for over 122 years. Um, U.S. colonial occupation on the island has imposed a, a model of economic labor exploitation, still political exclusion. Um, and through my work, um, uh, these are some of the narratives that we have internalized as, as a people. Um, these white supremacist narratives, they cast our society, as I said, as inferior, discernible, or, or corrupt. This is why uh, uh, President Trump was able to say, well, I'm not going to send you any money because you are the most corrupt government there is, right? Without acknowledging how U.S. occupation and colonialism has created the climate of corruption that we still deal with today. But this is, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of what my, the, the, own, the words of my, of my community uh, for instance, corruption and governmentality it has much to do with Puerto Rico politicians and how they manage our finances. They want your vote so they can start rubbing us. So in a, in a sense, we have internalized as a reality that yes, we are corrupt. We ought to be monitored. We ought to be deprived uh, um, um, from the polity of the US because we are a corrupt people. Deviancy in the way that we see ourselves. Uh, tricks and lies. That's how they, that's how we ask for help. I have a $500 check from the government, I spend it, I clean houses, and I ask to be part, uh, uh, paid under the table. This idea that we don't follow the rules, that we are inherently deviant, um, and that therefore we do need the U.S. to correct and to monitor our, our experiences. You see it in laziness, and, and I think the, the, the most corrupt and, and painful experience is the social fragmentation that you see even in Puerto Rican migrants, colonial migrants, when we come here to the US, right? You have this dynamic in which we don't wanna associate with each other because we think that when we come to places like Florida or Texas, right, that we damage it with drugs and alcohol and all this malas manas that they would say in, in Puerto Rico. Um, and that same narrative that casts our society as unknowledgeable, 
uh, corrupt, inferior, uh, at the same time, uh, portrays the U.S. as the source of correction, right? We need the U.S. Even in, in my conversations with, with people from the island and Puerto Ricans here in the U.S., it's even this idea that when we're able to acknowledge that uh, white supremacy and colonial oppression has created the conditions that have led to inequality in Puerto Rico, the island of Vieques, still four years after, after Hurricane Maria, has no, no hospital. Uh, there's 50% of island Puerto Ricans live in poverty, but yet even when we're able to acknowledge that, we still believe that we have this colonial debt, right? That we ought to be grateful uh, for U.S. occupation and for the supposed benefits that we get from U.S. citizenship and the ability to migrate here. Um, so even when we acknowledge that the this white gaze, this white supremacist thinking and narrative tells us that we we need more. We need we need the U.S. to take con complete control. And these are some of the, the what what is captured in the narratives that I that I share with you. Uh, for instance, um, one of the one of my recent participants talked about, you know, unfortunately, if you want something well to be done, you need the US, right? Because we are corrupt, we are in fear, we're not able to manage it ourselves, we need even more colonial uh, uh, control. So what does that mean for us? What do we, what do we go from here? Um, I think uh, as, as um, Pedro Malave talked about, um, he's a legal scholar, also, also Puerto Rican, um, he talks about the need for colonial reparations, right? And although in, in, a, in white American culture, um, reparations is typically um, associated with reparations uh, for the descendants of uh, enslaved Africans, he talks about the need for, separ for, rep for colonial reparations um, and to amend the damage um, that still is uh, uh, the injustice of Puerto Rico's territorial status. And he operationalized, right? Because we want to talk, so what does that mean for us? He operationalized four, four different demands. One of them, sovereignty, right? We, we, right now there's a movement for the decolonization of, of Puerto Rico, but it's not talked about, right? It's, it's only if you're Puerto Rican, you might've heard about it, but it's not part of our collective consciousness. Um, the reparation of the island of Vieques, um, reparation and, and the, the healing of the land and the, the restoration and the return of Occupy uh, Puerto Rico, psychological liberation, right? To disconnect and to liberate from these oppressive narratives uh, by telling the true story of US colonial oppression and the island by uh, um, challenging and resisting these oppressive narratives uh, and apology. Right, to acknowledge that this is, it has been going on for over 122 years, it continues to happen uh, and it must, it must end. Um, so hopefully I made justice to what I wanted to share with you um, and I look forward to, to conversation uh, uh, later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Capiello Rosario. Next we will turn to Dr. Alicia Musso who is a powerful presence in the Native American community, specifically the Oglala Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Wyoming and previously worked for the University of Montana's National Native Children's Trauma Center, working with tribal communities across the country in school and family settings. In November of last year, she made history as the first out LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ vice president of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Dr. Mousseau. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and thank you, everybody. Um, it is quite an honor to be here amongst you all. Uh, my name is Alicia Musso. My um, I'm the daughter of the late John and Vera Musso. I'm the granddaughter of the late Lena and James Musso. We're from Porcupine, South Dakota, here on the Pine Ridge Reservation. We are Ogla Lakota, and my Hunka parents are Howard and Karen Spoonhunter Brown of Arapaho, Wyoming. So um, I also want to apologize for speaking in front of my elders. Um, you know, our elders in our communities are wisdom keepers. They are the ones who teach and pass down our language and, and our traditional ways of knowing. Um, and so we usually defer to them for these things, but I'm very grateful to be able to um, pass on what I've learned thus far from my community um, here in the Pine Ridge Reservation, the Ogola Sioux Tribe. Um, 
And I do also want to recognize there are over 560 federally recognized tribes um, in the United States right now. Uh, there's a lot of diversity within our communities. And so I do not try to speak on behalf of other tribes. Um, you know, we, but we do know there is a true American history, this true nation's history that includes all of us, includes the indigenous people of this nation. Um, so, you know, having coming from one of the first people of this nation to, um, you know, being the majority to now one to 2% of this population uh, and, and understanding our history and, and from this perspective <laughs> um, it is quite something. And, and we talk about the historical traumas a lot in our tribal communities and indigenous communities because they are very real, they are very near. They have impacts still today that we are still trying to heal from and move forward from. And, and those systems that we have had to, to learn to work within and use in our communities were not made for us and by us. And that's why I introduced myself from who I come from because in our community, our kinship systems were our ways of knowing. Those, that is our culture. That is how we know who we are, who we come from and who we are, you know, we're passing that on to future generations. Um, and so those are, those are important things in our community that we try to pass on. But we also know with the many eras in this nation to exterminate and to, um, to, to exterminate American Indians, you know, the genocide that happened in this nation, um, the attempted genocide is, is real. And so it's important for us to recognize that uh, because we're still here. And even though our voice does not get out there as much as, um, you know, a lot of other minority voices, we are still here and we are still fighting and we are still passing on who we are to our communities and to, you know, and sharing that with each other. Um, and so it's important that we thank you once again for bringing this voice to the table um, because it is one that's not heard very much, the indigenous and tribal communities. And I hope that it continues on and I hope there are more that come to the table, you know, and sometimes they come around the mascot issues and, and those larger things um, that, that are in the, in the national news. Uh, but we know in our tribal communities we're facing, like I said, some of those things that have been passed on and historically, you know, some of those high health disparities that we have in our communities from diabetes to substance use. Um, but we also, know in our communities we have some of those high health disparities but we also have a lot of prevention in our culture and so we actually have some of the highest abstinence from substance use in our communities so you know understanding that through research and through um, other forms of western knowledge and merging the two and finding ways to to build on the two so we can advance our communities so we can continue to thrive and and survive um, is really rooted in, in who we are. And I, I appreciate all of the other, uh, you know, <laughs> the elders who have speak, spoke today because one of the elders that have taught me in our tribal college, Ogwa Lakota College, um, he, he, we have a lot of cool, cool classes there um, that talk about specifically who we are and, you know, in, in, in that form and in, in college form um, class-wise. And it's our elders in our community who teach us those classes. And uh, Mr. Calvin Jumping Bull was one of our teachers who taught us about the common person. And in being a common person, we all have a mind, we all have a body, we all have you know, a heart and we all have a spirit. Um, and that's what connects us. That's what connects us as people. That's what connects us to this land. That's what connects us to everything everything is alive, right? And I think that's another thing that is in a lot of our communities is, is that understanding that we're all connected, not just as people either, but to the land, to, to other, you know, animals, everything in our, in our environments and understanding that balance that it takes, you know, and not even, even just within ourselves as common people to find that balance, right? Between our mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And then also balancing that with the, with the other living spiritual beings around us. And so for us, we call it madakiase. We're all related. And, and I know we have that in a lot of different communities. And, and in that, I think that's where 
you know, we try to heal individually and as a community is understanding how we're connected. And, you know, we talk about reparations and, but I'm still just struggling with that to figure out what that means because it's, it's when something's taken away from you that means so much, what, what could ever replace that? So I, I'm looking forward to learning from all of you what that looks like or what, you know, that conversation more. Um, but I know in our communities, we're still looking for that and still trying to heal within um, and take care of each other. So once again, thank you for inviting our voice to the table. Um, and, and my apologies for speaking in front of my elders. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you also for uh, reminding us that there are such rich traditions and, and diverse voices that we could draw from in our country. And that's been a great strength uh, for a lot of the history, but also a great struggle. Um, so uh, we will now turn to about uh, 15 minutes of roundtable discussion. Uh, whereby the panelists themselves could uh, have a dialogue. I believe Dr. Washington has prepared some questions. Right. Uh, I, it may be robbery to even have these questions, but let's just begin uh, as best as possible. Thank you, Dr. Mosu, for, for reminding us the, of, again, a tradition in the context of, of family and community, mm -hmm. to know that there are those that have gone before us, so that we always, always give reverence uh, to, we speak to, and, I, and Dr. West actually did that by giving a proclamation of, of who was uh, on the line with us. And then you brought it at the end by saying that that is that, is that tradition that, that humanizes a population. And to be human is to acknowledge the fact that you're here because of others. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Carr, the US political system has uh, disenfranchised blacks, African people for over 400 years in this country. And you know, there's a discussion about HR 40 and HR uh, 1242, uh, the, the idea of uh, reparations and studying it. Uh, what do you think, what does this healing process look like and, and can HR 40 be really a part of that process uh, that really repairs or restores uh, populations? I learned from uh, Baba Wade and his generation, you know, we always ask for permission to speak, but thank you for, for modeling for us what it looks like to stand in an unbroken genealogy without apology and to be human in the world from that. Because to speak in front of one's elders, to apologize before speaking, it's not only beautiful, it's very instructive. And thank you for that. Um, Kevin, I, I look at HR 40 and as a member of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, and working with Brother Ron Daniels in the National African American uh, Reparations Coalition and knowing the work of CARICOM and those who've been working for this for many years, I too don't know what reparations looks like. And that's why I mentioned the violence of forgetting a little bit. HR 40 is one thing, HR uh, 1242, the 400 year uh, bill from a couple of years ago. You know, John Henry Clark used to say, and I think about it, while well, Cornell, like you said, all them years ago when you and he sat there in that conversation and you left a stamp on people who are still talking about that, brother. You know, John Clark used to say, if you start your history with slavery, everything since then looks like progress. And Jacob Carruthers, in a little pamphlet he wrote in 1972 called Science and Oppression, talks about this kind of ordinal orientation of the West numbers, what's important, and then pride of place. And he says, and if you ever get out of line of understanding that who's first is important in this society, they got a reserve, they got a theory of progress in reserve. Now is better than yesterday. And he says, all that's got to be displaced because it reinforces the hierarchy. And so I have to agree with you, uh, sis. I have to agree, agree with you, Sister Alicia. I don't know. See, and when I read HR uh, 1242, what I see is a reinscription of white nationalism and an invitation to join in the set the project. We were here too. As Richard Pryor say, fool, you want everybody, you want everybody mad at us too? <laughs> in other words, why are you trying to buy into this criminal enterprise? And at the same time, finally, as I said, I keep this very brief initially, and we would folks think the idea of uh, 
disfranchisement presumes that the notion of the franchise that sits at the center of this question of citizenship, which excludes everybody who's not a citizen, is something that we should continue to maintain. We just heard why we should let that go. These are occupied territories. If we're going to be human in the world, this whole project got to be renegotiated. Or else, you know, as Frederick Douglass said, you ask what the Negro wants, you know what the Negro wants is? Leave us alone. Let us go off in the maroon communities with our Native American can, like, <laughs> you know, let us go somewhere in the bush and reconstruct. Just leave us alone. So, no, I don't, no, nah, man, I don't even know what reparations means. But this conversation, I think, is the place where we begin to think through what that means. But honestly, after hearing you two, I am reminded of perhaps this is something we should think about a little bit more deeply than we have. Okay, thank you. Uh Barbara West, you you were about to say something. So so go on. Will you add to that conversation about what does it look like? Uh, and then uh, we want to slide into this conversation also about truth and reconciliation. We saw that happen in um, in South Africa, and we want to know what do you think about that? Has that been advantageous? And uh, Baba Wade, I, I would love for you to weigh in on this as well. Or has it been a detriment uh, to the uh, to the populace? Right. And so we talk about TRC, Truth and Reconciliation a Commission. And we add to that conversation reparations. Uh, so HR 40, beneficial, TRC, is something that we should consider in the United States. Uh, um, there it is, there's the question. And, and, and was that, that was for me, my brother? Oh, appreciate it. I just want to thank you for so, so smoothly and insightfully orchestrating in this, this conversation though, brother, I'm telling you, because your summaries and things provide a clarity for me so that, that shows how we're actually on the same wavelength. It seems to me the common denominator right now is given the spiritual decay in the empire and the moral decrepitude in the society, that there is a spiritual maturity in this dialogue that has to do with an intellectual humility inseparable from a moral tenacity. So there's a willingness to fight, but you notice when Brother Carr said, well, you know, I'm gonna acknowledge that uh, it, it's just unclear as to what, I, I, it's unclear to me too. It's unclear, I, my, my dear indigenous sister, uh, uh, my dear sister Alicia and so forth. So I, I think that's very important because we're in such a grim moment that we don't want to act as if we know things that we really don't know and pontificate as if we are sitting in a status that generates the same kind of arrogance and the same kind of haughtiness, the same kind of condescension. But there's also a revolutionary piety. And I think this is very important in terms of our uh, relation to ancestors, because if we understand piety, as the sources of good in our life from our mama's womb to tomb, then our relation to those who came before is not uncritical at all. We, we're building on, but we're, it's a virtuous acknowledgement of how we have been shaped, that we are who we are because somebody loved us. We are who we are, somebody cared for us. We are who we are, somebody shaped us. And family, two voices of the dead who we never met, but still, relate to us. Some of us go to sleep with Martin and Malcolm and Fanny and Ella, Ella Fitzgerald and Ella Baker, that they sustain us. You know, Can't make it without Donnie Hathaway. Can't make it without Luther Vandross. Can't make it without Teddy Pendergrass. Can't make it without Dramatics and the Delphonics and, and the Emotions and the Jones Girls. That's what healing is. So piety goes hand in hand with healing. And I, I think this is very important because if you look at it from the dominant European point of view, as soon as you start talking about ancestors, you say, oh, no, we're supposed to be critical of authority. That's what the Enlightenment taught us. Well, well, you know, a comp begins with what is Enlightenment, with what? Invoking with Horace. So he says he's against all authority, but not Horace's authority. Dare to know. No, no, everybody got some ancestors that they going to invoke if you really want a, prog a program to get off the ground. And this is very important, but we had to be critical about it. We had to be selective, as Brother Gregory said. And 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 that's one reason why, you know, I I I have I don't have enough words, for Brother Wade, because and way he said he set him up. Brother, you went sailing, man. It was it was a Commodore Zoom, man. You took us off into the freedom dream that, that Lionel Richard and the others took us off on, brother. That's what it's all about. 
to get us away, get some critical distance from all of this sickness and mess and lies and mendacity and criminality and say, let's get a perspective to understand so when we re-engage, we have that maturity, that humility, that tenacity, that piety that generates a solidarity because the best of an African people is always what it does it mean to be human for everybody based on the best of our R-O-O-T-S so that our R-O-U-T-E-S from every corner of the globe is informed by the best of our past. And so when I, when I think about reparations, I think very, very briefly that it's truly we got to begin with where we are and work with what we got. I'm not against getting a whole lot of money from the ruling class for poor people. They suffer. They need access to resources. They need decent schools. They need health care. They need quality uh, education and so forth and so on. But that has to be done independent. Uh, that cannot be done without the kind of critique we have of our Puerto Rican system, of the colonies, listening to Albizo, listening to Lolita Lebron, listening to Julia de Burgos, all of those voices that are critical of the ways in which the American empire has tried to dehumanize, tried to dominate our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters. So in that sense, it's just, it's, it's voices together. This, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And thank you again, Sister Lee, for bringing us together and Brother Washington for bringing us together. Because I, I'm, I'm fired up, I'm full, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to throw down. I see you ready to take off over there. That that uh, chair can't contain like you. It's like Zoom, man. <laughs> you brought in the Commodores and Coltrane. I mean, that's a that's a roll call for you. The uh, how do we how do we invoke? And you mentioned the invoking, right? And uh, among the Zulu, they, they talk about Ubuntu that says that your humanity is tied to my humanity. That we can only be human together. That the only way that we have agency is that we recognize that we are uh, together, not simply me. Uh, I'm together. Dr. Nobles, uh, uh, you remind us that uh, when bringing Dr. Fuki out into, into perspective about uh, about we are here, we are the yet to be born and the, those that have uh, also been here before. So uh, what are your thoughts about reparations and H.R. 40 and and um, and this whole process of, of, w of what does it mean to repair? And I think that we own this space now of the spiritual repair. I think that we are blessed. We, we are actually uh, healing ourselves in this conversation if we quiet ourselves and listen carefully. I, I, I want to speak to um, this question of reparations in this way. Reparations should be reframed as restoration. As restoration. See, in repairing, you repair the damage. In restoring, you have to know what wellness looks like in order to get there. And so I think we should begin, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about this HR stuff because those are brothers and sisters trying to get some, some, some mediation through a system that is already designed to work against them. But, but they're there and I want them to do the best they can do there. But for me, I think we have to think outside of it. We should applaud that, give them all the support we can and, and, and recognize that you can't call, the first act you call for should not be an apology. If I've been sitting at your table playing cards and you've been cheating me all along, it's not enough for you to say, I apologize for cheating. What you got to do is give me back the damn money you stole from me. It's simple as that. And so the restoration has to be to restore that which you prevented me from obtaining in terms of my own sense of wellness. It is a simple, it's a, it's a simple mathematic equation for me, and I may be naive, but I'm looking around reading sometimes these accounts of what this government is doing against COVID, and I'm hearing things like you know, $1.6 billion is going to be set aside to give everybody a nickel in each family. But in fact, the matter, if we can find $1.4 billion, can we also give them the assignment? You figured out to prevent us from being human for 400 years. You figure out how to allow us to restore our wellness for the next 400 years. That means give me 400 years of free education that I define. Give me 400 years of free housing that I define what my house even look like structurally. Give me 400 years of what 
what healing or wellness looks like. So it's a, it's a simple equation. You've been cheating, so not, don't apologize for cheating. You give back what you stole from me. You stole from my people 400 years to think freely as an African, to think an African thought. You took from me the ability to think an African thought. And that African thought may not have come out of my mouth. It may come out as what, what Cornell's always mentioned. Our musicians struggle with giving a tone that was African in the medium that they worked through. Well, give me 400 years to figure out what's my tone, uninhibited by your influence. Your influence. Look, there's something called, I'm going to start with this. There's something called Moko Jumbi. You all may know of Moko Jumbi. Moko Jumbi is what's called the stilt walkers. The stilt walkers were people who got these long, long poles, stood on these long pole, pole poles, and we were amazed by their ability to balance themselves on these long poles. But what we didn't pay attention to was that the, the costume of the stilt walker was a mask, a mask that attracted the ancestral energy. And so the sisters and brothers on the stilt walker were walking around, raise themselves up high. Now I'm rescuing that. Raise your consciousness up very, very high so that each stilt has a responsibility. One leg of the stilt is to engage in the decolonization of the mind. One leg. Second leg of the stilt is to affirm the being of being African. Now, check this out. Let's put John Coltrane on the background and do the Moko Jumbi dance. <laughs> Let's do the Moko Jumbi dance where we raise our consciousness up so high that we can see evil coming. That's what the purpose of the Moko Jumbi really was, was to raise up the, the still walker so high that they could see far, far away and see when evil is coming, to, then to call for protection. Raise ourselves up so, so high that we can see what medicine needs to be brought to the community. That's the affirming of African being. So these two still walk, this walk, these two legs, these still stilts should be our Moko Jumbi dance, where we in fact raise our consciousness. So reparation is the restoration of our ability to understand what is the illness that's infecting us, to raise our consciousness so we can restore the medicine that we need to affirm being African. Do the Moko Jumbi dance. Every now, every now, you say, wait a minute, no, no, don't get confused. I don't want no apology. I want you to get out the way so I can do the Moko Jumbi dance. I can call the truth as I see it with one leg of the still. I can, I can attract the healing medicine, the healing bomb. I can attract that bomb with the other leg. One leg, Moko Jumbi dance. Second leg, Moko Jumbi dance. Then we can talk about restoration, not reparation. Repairing is to repair the damage. Well, if the damage is that we have, we live in a broken house in America, repairing that is to have a fixed house in America. But the fixed house in America was not the problem. The problem is America. So I want to restore, not repair. And I restore by giving myself the opportunity to wonder. See, wonderment is a wonderful thing. To wonder, to rescue our ancestral inspiration to say, here's what wellness looks like. Look at, uh, our people understood about reincarnation, but it wasn't reincarnation the way Europeans taught us. It was reincarnation to say, you have come back to complete what your ancestors left incomplete. I am my ancestors. I don't go worship my ancestors. I am literally the incarnation of ancestral energy of Africa that's come back and sits in me and say, now your job, your job is to do what? To complete what I left incomplete. That's why I talked about it in, my, in the book about the Haitian revolution. It's unfinished. So we have to be bookman. We have to be Desaline. We have to be uh, the, the revolution. We have to be uh, Cecile Fatima, who was the sister who said, I'm going to tell y'all what your role is in this revolution. Sister got up and said, give me the black pig. And I'm going to slit this black, po po this black throat of this pig. And I'm going to tell you what you do to, to claim your freedom, to claim being well in this place called Haiti. So I think we've got to do the Moko Jumbi dance. Restoration, not reparation. Not reparation. I, I know that others won't want to speak. I did want to just uh, put out here that we know about the Cherokee uh, Trail of Tears, and we know that uh, someone just put something in the uh, chat that just brought this back to remembrance. Uh, also, the uh, the mascot discourse 
about the Redskins or the Cleveland Indians. Uh, how has this been a disruption to the psychological wellness of, of indigenous populations in general, uh, Alicia, and, um, and this great land grab? Uh, and what is, what is that meant to the indigenous population? You talk about how to talk about reparations and not Baba says uh, uh, rest restoration. And then also this, this major looming question about Deb Holland and the uh, uh, Secretary of the Interiors. And, and there's, a, there's a, uh, a concern that if she's the Secretary of Interiors and the indigenous population is gonna now take the land back. So that, I mean, I've, I've heard that particular paranoia coming up. So, so um, uh, Alicia, Mosu, Dr. Mosu, what, what are your thoughts about all of that? Just, just take something and just, just massage that. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of pieces in there, but let me, um, it though, right? it's all connected for sure. And um, tribal communities are, I believe we are all in support of, of Congresswoman Holland. Um, you know, uh, it, it's one thing to um, have someone at the table who knows what, what our communities go through to be able to, you know, and speak and watching her, um, you know, answer all the questions to, to move forward. Um, you know, and I'm sure many travel communities are like, what? Like, <laughs> but she did amazing and we'd support her hundred percent. And as far as us getting our land back and, um, I like what, uh, Dr. Noble just talked about, about, you know, restoration, restoring. Um, I, I like that a lot better. That resonates. That feels real, like way better because, um, like Dr. Carr also talked about, you know, this earth may take us out before we take each other out. Um, and so restoring this earth, restoring uh, these lands, you know, and uh, our, uh, the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota tribes have been offered monies for the Black Hills. You know, that, that's our sacred place. That's, that's, and tribal communities have sacred sites that are who they are, like our origination story is from the Black Hills. We came out of Wind Cave and we know that story. We share that story. We, that's, our, that's where we come from. And you can't give us any amount of money to take away where we came from, you know what I mean? To, to make it okay to take where we came from. Um, so I think a part of uh, Deb Holland uh, being, um, you know, the Secretary of the Interior, uh, and as far as natives getting their land back, that's definitely something um, that we would appreciate. However, um, there's no amount of money you can give us for our sacred sites because that's who we are um, and we know who we are. So uh, we don't need money to know that. <laughs> but at least acknowledging and not continuing to desecrate our sacred sites or, you know, just just make, you know, transform them into tourist sites or just totally get rid of them. Um, our ancestors are in there, our ancestors' bloods in, in those sacred sites. So that's why we honor and protect them so much. Um, and as far as the mascots, um, you know, that's something I honestly didn't understand. You know, growing up on the Pine Ridge Reservation, we're pretty, uh, we're kind of a majority population. It's very rare to have, you know, tribal communities where it's all your tribal community. Um, and so once I finally started to venture out and go into different, you know, communities uh, across the nation and finding myself down in Kansas City um, on an internship for psychology and the Kansas City Chiefs are right there and, you know, people are doing the tomahawk chop and, um, you know, first coming into um, people saying their great grandma's a Cherokee princess, like we don't have that where where we're at nobody is saying my great grandma's a ogla lakota when when they don't know their history people in our border towns don't want to be labeled as native american or ogla or you know um they don't want to be labeled but in these areas that don't understand that history they don't understand the history of those tribes and can say like my great grandma's a cherokee princess without knowing that and support a team that that characterizes a group of people as you know fictional beings um i got an understanding of it and and i got to be able to uh you know see it firsthand of why it's so important to to really look at those pieces in the larger national context and really fight for um to be humanized to be recognized as as people of this nation first people of this nation um, so I hope I answered your questions and all the pieces in there. And like I said, everything's related, but I do like Dr. Noble's uh, 
restoration piece that I, I can I can get down with that for sure. Thank you. You got the rapid fire because we have. I mean, the time is just so, so, so compressed. I had so many things I wanted to ask you. Uh, one uh, one last one, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Lee, and that goes to uh, Rosario. The, uh, Dr. Rosario, there's been this dis discourse about building the wall, uh, and of course, it's not not the Puerto Rican conversation, but it's but uh, Latinx discourse nonetheless. Uh, the um, build the wall conversation, the breaking up of families in detainment centers. Uh, the conversation has been one that has been disruptive, I'm sure, to the mental well-being of uh, those classified as Latinx. Uh, so what are your thoughts about this past administration and this disruption and how does that tie into the notion of reparations and or restoration? What moving forward? Yes. It's, it's the same dynamic of coloniality, right? Because if I'm able, right, even in the terminology of legality and illegality, right, with illegality, what I'm saying is that you are outside the boundaries of what I think is acceptable. And if I'm able to put you there, then I can then treat you, I can separate you, I can traumatize you. Um, and it's that same dynamic of inhumanity uh, that, has, that allows for that conversation to even move forward, that I, I wanna keep them out. Um, but I think in terms of, of how do we move forward, I think the, the struggle um, that I experience mostly within, within my Latinx communities um, is this idea of fragmentation and social conflict where, where Puerto Ricans and Cubans and Dominicans and Mexicans, we, we just, there's no solidarity among our groups. Um, and that in itself is a production of colonial oppression and what we have internalized about ourselves. And, and, we need to get to a place where we're able to imagine, right, what liberation is for us, um, but the main barrier that we still experience um, is that there is, there is such conflict within our communities uh, where we, you know, Puerto Ricans uh, uh, would praise even the, the erection of the wall, um, that they would talk about how as US citizens, Right. You all talked about U.S. citizenship and how that meant right, more humanity and how we can then engage in that conversation of, yes, building the wall and keeping our Latinx siblings uh, from entering the country. And that in itself, right, that is a colonial technology, because if I'm able to create conflict between all of you, you all won't come together. Right. It, it, it maintains the system of oppression. Um, and so, so for us, I think that, that I don't want to call it a task, but more of a, you know, how do we, how do we heal separation? How do we heal fragmentation in our, in our communities? Um, and yeah, so those are my thoughts on that. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's so amazing that this all, the conversation links together and no matter what happened, no matter who spoke, it stayed on the in the realm of what is true to spirit, uh, and spirit has no beginning, has no end. I mean, whether it was the intellect uh, talking politics, it was spirit. If it was psychology, it was spirit. Um, uh, it has just been that conversation, which is very different from the one that talks about the legalities, the the law, and who's entitled to what. Uh, given that we are almost out of time, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Washington for your wonderful summary. Uh, uh, I know that uh, Dr. West needed to leave right on the hour. So I'd like to thank you, doc, uh, Dr. West, for joining us. Um, we can stay on for about 10 more minutes to try to answer some questions uh, from the audience. What we normally do is ask you uh, to go to participants at the bottom of your screen. And uh, there's an option to raise your hand to the right. Uh, and meanwhile, please feel free also to uh, enter your questions into the chat in case we run out of time. Thank, thank you, you for sir. everything. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm thank not, you, just, Brother Cornell. So thank rich, you so, so much for thank joining you. us. It's, it's so, been such a gift. It's been so, so wonderful. So wonderful. And, uh, you know, with the Grammys tomorrow, remember that Curtis Mayfield never won a Grammy, but he was one of the greatest love warriors ever. <laughs> it's a one mini, another great one, but the greatest of my generation, Stevie Wonder, love warrior, 
He's like the boys. He's on his way to Africa. Mm. He's going mm -hmm. to God. You see, and this raises all kinds of questions in terms of our spirituality, our political engagement, the kind of thing that Brother Wade Noble has been teaching us for many, 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 many decades. So I'm so sorry I got this 430 thing because you know I love to be here. This spirit is so rich. <laughs> I can push the others back. I could, but they, they, they waiting for me. So I'm, so, so I'm hugging each and every one of y'all. Y'all stay strong. Thank you. Thank you again. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe. Hey, no, I appreciate you. Indeed, Brother Wade. And I love you, love you, love you, brother. So we have, what, about uh, 10 minutes left just to have a quick uh, q and I I don't know if anyone has some questions. Great. We'll um, start with the first question coming from Marion. If you can, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, this is Marion Douglas Ungara in Washington. And um, I think we should have another session, number one. How does Pan-Africanism, that we, how do we acknowledge populations of the Americas and let us negotiate our relationship between indigenous people and Afro descendants and those of us who are both. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. My name is Tasha Friday. I apologize um, for my uh, laid back appearance, but um, you know, the listening to everyone speak, you know, my life experience, I'm half native American, half African American. So my life experience is kind of the apex where, where this all comes together and intersects. And specifically in regard to the question that was just asked, I would say that phenotypically you know, I'm, I'm viewed as an African-American woman, um, maybe a different hair texture or something to that effect. Um, I was raised by my Native American grandmother. So um, culturally I have all of those teachings and traditions. So really trying to reconcile those um, as someone who's lived, has the lived experience as an indigenous woman is hard enough. So when you're several steps removed from, from your ancestry and your culture, it makes it that much more difficult. I will share that some of the greatest racism that I've ever received and most hurtful have been from African Americans, not, not accepting me. And then my native people not accepting me. So I think it really goes back to the work that we all have to do in our individual communities. And those of mm -hmm. us who represent multiple communities have to work with both sides, all sides, um, to really talk about acceptance and acknowledgement of our own racism, whether that's something that we have taken on from the colonizer or something that, that that's in us for whatever reason. So um, again, as with everything else that you all have discussed, it's a process. Um, I am never a fan though of claiming things that we don't have a connection to. So I think it's more about the learning and, and, and getting that connection. If that's something that is important to you, finding your individual connection and then and, and making those connections to your ancestors in that way and worry about the people on earth later, they'll, they'll come along. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can take two questions uh, in succession and try to answer them. Great, our next question will be from Dr. Patricia Nunley. If you can unmute your mic and ask your question next. How do we, as the people of color, the humans, uh, the ones who continue to understand humanity, work with our white folks um, or should we just disengage with them and heal ourselves? That's the question. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, next question, please. Great. And the next one will be from Robert Covington. Please unmute your mic and go ahead. Hi, um, good evening. Uh, my question is for um, Dr. Nobles. Dr. Nobles, I, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are in terms of um, organizations that are created by white Americans that would actually confront the sickness of white supremacy in terms of developing organizations to confront it from the lens of white Americans trying to deconstruct whiteness and what it has done to them and what it has meant to them within the context of being able to have more resonance and more power um, and more viability with fellow white Americans under the gaze of the white gaze. So I was wondering what you think of that. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Um, the questions were, how do we work with white folks and organizations to deconstruct white supremacy? Would uh, someone, or Dr. Nobles, would you like to address both? Let me try to address both very quickly. I think that um, once we recognize that white supremacy is a mental illness, then the question is how do we help those who are mentally ill to seek out the medicine they need to become well? We, can, we can't help them be well. 
In fact, the white there should be we should support the idea of white organizations working to help white mentally deranged people to be well. In terms of uh, Patricia's question about working with white folks, white organizations can't help me to be black. They can create an environment that allows me to find the understanding of my blackness. There are really three things that I think we should all take into account. And I use three E's, essence, experience, and expression, three E's. I have to find my essence. That's why we rescue African deep thought and wisdom traditions to find what it means to be essentially African. I have to also identify how does my experience align with my essence? That becomes a political question. I have to also ask, what do I adorn myself that represents the expression of my essence? So if every single ethnic group has the license to say, I'm going to define what is the, my essence. No one else can do that for me. Then I can engage with others to create an environment that allows me to express my essence unimpeded. I can also adorn my, my essence with the very aesthetic that reinforces, recognizes, and acknowledges it. Essence, expression, experience. That we all have in common. But the answer to those things, we have to work out for ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us for a lively discussion. Sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Again, please feel free to enter them into the chat. So we will answer them for our website. We hope to see you at our next town hall. Thank you again, all our speakers and everyone. Thank you, Bandy, and thank you, Kevin, for inviting us to sit with you in your presence. I think, thank you, Baba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence. <laughs>